Hey guys, it's time for episode number 218. And if you've ever thought about creating your own line and manufacturing a product or even working deeper in the wholesale side of the industry, you're really going to like today's episode because our guest is on fire. Let's talk about your business strategy and the juicy details of what actually works from mainstream fashion to fashion on Main Street and the entire ecosystem behind it. How do we scale your company and do it with the balance and the happiness that we all seek? Let's hear from those insiders, experts, and strategists that actually make it happen. I'm your host, Ashley Alderson from the Boutique Hub, and I can't wait to chat. Hey guys. Today's guest is one that is so on fire for her work. I can't wait for you to hear her story and some of the truth bombs that she's gonna drop today. Michelle Manningham, as you might know her from her pink hair, is the founder of Texie Boots with the original Pink Soul. Today, Michelle's gonna talk to us about what it was like to have this idea that she wrote down in a doodle on a piece of scratch paper and how she took that idea to over 400 different manufacturing contacts and heard no all but one time. And it was that one yes that sparked a competition between manufacturers to create and carry her product. Today, we're not just going to talk about manufacturing your own line, but Michelle also owns a brokerage firm called Pink and Associates. So today we're going to talk about what it takes to get your products carried by the mass markets, what it takes to work in wholesale, how to be a better brand rep, and really what's happening in the evolving and changing side of our wholesale industry. Now, Michelle is not only passionate about her own business and supporting other businesses that she works with directly, but she's really passionate about supporting entrepreneurs as a whole. You know, it was through Michelle's time working with the international brand Poopery, if you're familiar with them, that she was so inspired to start to help other entrepreneurs as well. So Michelle also founded the Heart and Soul Conference, which hosts over 200 aspiring entrepreneurs annually. Guys, there are some real, real truth bombs here. I promise some like like mic drop moments. So I can't wait for you to hear from Michelle directly. And plus you have to stick around to the end because we thought we'd throw in a fun giveaway for you guys today that I know you're going to love to check out. So without further ado, let's visit with Michelle. Hey guys, I'm so excited about our guest today on the show. If you haven't followed Texie Boots yet, the boots with the pink soles, number one, you have to do that. But number two, you have to listen up because Michelle Manningham is joining me today on the show. And we are going to drop some serious truth bombs today about what it means to create a brand, what it means to work with manufacturers, and also our take on what's happening in the wholesale industry today. So Michelle, are you ready for this? I am so ready. Thank you so much for having me. Oh man, I feel like I've been your Instagram stalker for a while. Like I've watched what you've been doing with Texie Boots for a long time. So when you and I had the opportunity to meet in Dallas, I was so excited because I really admire everything you're doing. I think that makes two of us. In fact, I was talking to my fiance this morning and he was like, how do you know Ashley? I was like, um, to say that I had been stalking her would be a true fact. <laughs> I'm not going to stop until you and I met. And I'm not sure how I ended up tracking down your cell phone number, but I was like, I have to meet Ashley. I love what she's doing. <laughs> oh man, I love Instagram for that reason. I love it when Instagram friends become real life friends. So kudos. I know you have so much value to share today on so many different fronts. So I want to get right into it because I know our listeners are going to love your story. If you would go back to, I think Texie Boots was really kind of your jumping off point into this whole industry. First, tell the listeners a little bit about Texie Boots as it is today, if they aren't already familiar, and then give us the backstory of how it got started. Okay. The backstory is where it gets really juicy. But uh, today, Texie Boots, we've trademarked the original pink sole cowgirl boot. And I just love the fact that it's a brand to wear. If you're wearing a pair and you see another girl out and about wearing a pair of those boots, you have an instant friend and you'll recognize that soul anywhere. And the passion behind it is we give back to female entrepreneurs. So if any girl buys a boot, 10% of that goes back to other, other female entrepreneurs. So that's kind of what I call the heart behind the soul. But, uh, you can't miss them. I've only released three styles so far, but I've got. 13 done and in the hopper for the next two years. So we've got a a lot in the pipeline. 
Awesome. Where do most people pick up Texi Boots? Do you mainly go direct to consumer or do you have boutiques or more big box stores that carry the brand? Yep. So right now it's just direct to consumer. So people can only find them online. However, I've been in the wholesale industry, not with Texi Boots, but with other brands for a little over three years. And I've since kind of transitioned some things. So I've got more time to launch Texi Wholesale. So in August, Texi is officially going to make her wholesale debut at the Dallas Western Market. So I can take a lot of the stuff that I've learned through the industry and actually apply it to uh, to Texi Boots, which I'm really excited about. Awesome. Well, we'll be there. We'll be there to cheer you on for sure. Yay, that'll be awesome. (laughs) So cool. All right. Well, tell us how the idea got started, because I think your story is really interesting about how you went for it, right? And found a manufacturer and you made the dream a reality. Yeah. So I knew nothing about manufacturing, but 19 years old actually is when the dream hit me. And it was kind of a surreal moment that I will never forget. I was shopping. Well, at the time I was 19, I didn't have a lot of money. So I really was window shopping on Michigan Avenue. And I saw this lady walk out of Chanel. And I swear she looked like she was wearing $30,000 worth of clothes and jewelry. And I mean, she just, she looked like she had just walked off a Christian Dior runway. And like a stalker, I just sat there. I locked eyes with her. And I literally watched her just walk across the street. And that was the moment that I said, I want to design something that I will one day just be walking and shopping and see women walking across the streets, wherever I am, wearing something that I had designed. And uh, that never left me. And at the time I was married, I was married for seven years and he was not supportive at all of me pursuing that dream. So seven years later, once, you know, I went through a divorce with him, I went back and got a full-time corporate job. Him and I had a a business together, which is why he wanted my focus there and not on my dream to build the boot brand. But I knew I still wanted to do it, but had no clue where to start. And so I started buying up used boots at antique shops. First of all, who would want to buy that anyway? (laughs) Like a used boot. But then I started buying arts and crafts and crystals from Michael's and Dreamtime Creations. And I literally started gluing crystals onto these used boots that I bought and started trying to resell them. And I was the vice president of marketing for a trade show management firm during the day at the time. And then at night, I would come home and glue crystals onto my boots (laughs) and try to resell them (laughs) on Facebook, which was not successful. So I still have every pair I ever crystallized. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. So how did you get it from that point where you were hand making all of these upcycled boots? How did the light bulb hit you of like, oh, this is how I actually get into manufacturing and start finding a partner that can produce this boot for me? Well, once I realized it was going to take me about 80 hours per pair, I was like, I'm going to be 80 years old and have sold, you know, 10 pairs of boots because this takes forever. (laughs) And it was actually, I left the job where I was at as the VP of marketing and I transitioned into the wholesale industry, actually working for Poopery Corporate, the spray before you go toilet spray. Yes. (laughs) And I'm sure everyone's seen the hilarious commercial. Well. The owner of Poopery, Susie Batiz, who, by the way, just made the Forbes list of the top 100 self-made women in the world next to like Reese Witherspoon and Oprah. She was like, you've got to start pursuing this Texi Boots dream. Why don't you find a manufacturer? And I was like, what's a manufacturer? (laughs) (laughs) You mean I don't have to glue all these crystals on myself? And she's like, no, honey. And so I just started Googling like boot manufacturers. I started Googling anyone and everyone that had anything to do with leather production or leather products. And I sent out a total of over 400 emails uh, to anyone that if they made leather belts, if they made boots and their website was completely in Spanish. I mean, it didn't matter asking them if they would be willing to private label or knew of a a boot manufacturer that could help me get my boot design off the ground. 
And I got one email reply back out of the 400 plus that I sent out. I'm pretty sure it was one line. It translated in Spanish that said, we can make boot. And (laughs) (laughs) then I was like, okay, well, I had this one little sketch of a boot that I had doodled in a journal and I highlighted the sole pink, literally with a pink highlighter. I was like, all right, well, this isn't really like a tech pack. I don't know if I can just like scan and send him my doodle sketch, which I need to let you see because it's hilarious. So I try to make a better doodle sketch and send it to them. Well, fast forward seven months, my sample boot came back and it was horrible. Like it was literally the ugliest thing I'd ever seen. I wouldn't have even paid $10 for it. So I just went back. I did round two of 400 emails at this point. Instead of asking them to private label, I asked for referrals, got one email back, and I went through the whole cycle again. That boot seven months later came back and it was horrible. And so I decided I would just walk a Western market. And because I worked at Poopery, I could get a badge. So I got in and I just started walking just to see what these other boot brands are doing. I was like, maybe I can meet a manufacturer. And I ended up meeting Ladane, who works with Macy Bean Boots. And one of the nicest human beings on the planet, Ladane. Literally, I tell her that she is my angel Mm -hmm. because I started talking to her and then ended up reaching out to her after the market. And I was like, do you think you would be willing to private label boots for me? (laughs) And she's like, well, no, honey. I mean, I personally don't make the boots, but I can introduce you to a manufacturer that might be able to partner with you. And so she made an introduction. I, of course, was a nobody. I didn't even have a website up at that point. I had no social media handles. If they pulled up my Facebook page, it was my blinged out boots that I had done in my parents' house. So they blew me off. So what I did was I called another boot manufacturer, booked a facility tour with them, and then called the one back that Ladane had said. And I said, I'm going to have a facility tour with one of their competitors. So I think it would be in their best interest to meet with me or I'm going to have to go meet with so-and-so. And they agreed. I drove nine hours one way for that meeting with my sketch, (laughs) my doodle in tow. And uh, I swear I was shaking the entire way. I had to drive through the night for that meeting. And it was like a 30 minute meeting that literally changed my life. And we ended it on a handshake that yes, they would be willing to, you know, manufacture the line. But the difference was, is I had to have the vision. Mm-hmm. So like I saw where it was going. I saw the jet planes. I saw the brand. I saw the the giving back and impacting female entrepreneurs. Like I saw the brand so clearly before I stepped in mm-hmm. that I don't even think they paid attention to that sketch because it was literally the passion that I had sitting across the table from them mm-hmm. that they were willing to take a risk on. Oh my gosh. I love this story <laughs> because for a hundred reasons, but number one, like, A, how does a person send a total of 800 emails and get two kind of yeses that ended up falling apart, right? And then have the tenacity to like leverage two manufacturers like that, which was brilliant. And then, I mean, just to go all in with that same doodle sketch, so many people could have gone into that situation and given up and been like, oh, it's too hard. Oh, it's not for me. But if anyone's met you in person, like you have a fire about you. How did you dig deep enough to have that drive and determination and to know this is the right thing, even when you felt like you were out of your league? It started years before I even started gluing those crystals on the boots. So much of that digging deep comes from, and I hate to say this because people really can start anytime, but I pour into myself mentally every day. From even your podcast, you know, podcasting, reading, and I know all of this sounds so cliche, but I had changed so much of my mindset that I didn't even understand the word no. Not having it wasn't an option. And so it wasn't a matter of would it work? It's just when will it and with who? Mm. You don't just get that overnight. That's a daily filling yourself up and getting your mind right. So when you go out there, your armor is what you've you've built within. Man, I hope everybody like pauses and hits rewind to hear you say that because it's a choice, right? And everyone has the same opportunity to make that choice no matter what their dreams are. But you just have to dig deep to find that and mentally prepare yourself that no is not an option. I think that's beautiful. 
So if someone is listening and they're at home with a product and they're like, gosh, I want to find a manufacturer after everything you've been through and, you know, now having this line, where would you tell somebody to start if they were wanting to start the manufacturing process? I don't want to say I'm an expert on manufacturing, but you know, for me, I just started scouting other companies that already existed doing what I had wanted to do. And then, (laughs) I mean, literally I was Googling boot manufacturers, boot manufacturers in Mexico, boot manufacturers in Spain. But I also started looking up companies that currently existed in the boot world and try to find out where they were manufactured. Some companies are willing to private label, especially nowadays with the shift in retail. So if someone has a great product idea, Mm -hmm. you know, there may be another company that may be willing to private label for you. I mean, you'd want to make sure that you've got your trademarks and, you know, if there's anything within it, you can differentiate or patent or whatever, like you protect yourself, but, um, just starting, start somewhere, (laughs) do something in the direction that you want to go, even if it's just a stinking Google search. Right. And I think one more thing that you mentioned earlier was the value of that meeting with Ladane that you had you know, this entire industry is about relationships, right? So the more people you know, the better. And it's all about creating win-win scenarios and friendships with people you meet along the way. Yeah. And I love what you say, you know, with the boutique hub, it's community over competition. And I don't necessarily feel like I'm in competition with anyone because The mission for that brand is to help inspire and support female entrepreneurs. And there is enough business to go around everywhere. So even if they don't have Mm -hmm. a big mission behind their brand, you just have to be clear on your value proposition and what you bring Mm -hmm. to the table. And and there's room for everyone. Absolutely. So talk to me about that mission to support female entrepreneurs and where that came from and how Taxi Boots gives back today. So it all goes back to Poop Spray. Susie, the founder of Poopery, she pushed me. And she used to always tell me, girl, you just need to get out there and fly. Like, this is your time. Start chasing your dreams. And I was working for her as an employee, yet she had such a passion and a mission for women to just break out and actually find your genius and find that little thing that's hiding inside of you that you are trying to ignore that actually exists and actually start following it and pursuing it. And you could change the world. So she pushed me and I had just decided that, you know what? I really beat my head against the wall trying to get to the point that I was shaking hands over the table with that manufacturer who verbally agreed to take on my line. And I got in my car and cried for nine hours with my doodle sketch back home because we had finally got a manufacturer who could make my dream come true. Like, because I didn't know what I was doing, there have got to be so many women out there with those same fears, those same hesitations. And I want to help support them just like Susie came in and was like, girl, you got this. You have everything it takes. And she pushed me. So I didn't know what it was going to be, but I was like, you know what? We're going to take 10% of every sale, 10% of all the profit. And every year I want to be able to pour that back into another female entrepreneur to help her launch her business. And our first year, instead of me giving it to one single entrepreneur, I decided to produce a women's conference. And it was called the Heart and Soul Conference, but it was S-O-L-E. And we were able to give, by producing all that, over 25000 my first year back to female founders. And since then, girls have launched brands, companies. I mean, you don't realize the ripple effect of your small choices compounded over time, the impact that they can make in someone's life. I love that because I think consumers today, A, are so much more aware of this than we give them credit for. But I would say boutique owners and retailers and a lot of, I would say, the emerging wholesale brands like yours, like yours will be in August, right? Those who are finding success are the ones that understand that there's a bigger mission behind everything we do. And it's not just us trying to sell a product, but it's creating a better place in the world than the way that we found it. Yep. A hundred percent. And that's the way shoppers nowadays are wanting to go. They want to buy products that do more than just make them feel good. Mm -hmm. It makes them feel good to buy products that are making an impact. Absolutely. Let's flip the switch a little bit because not only do you have Texie Boots, but you also have another business operating in the industry. So talk to me about Pink and Associates and kind of how you flip hats in the middle of the day to operate in the industry this way. Yeah, absolutely. So Pink and Associates is basically a company 
that's mine. And I sell products into retail stores. So right now I've got three different brands that I'm working with very aggressively to put on retail shelves. Now, a lot of them are not necessarily in the gift industry. They're more mass related products that are sold into Target and Publix. And I know some of the big box sometimes that can feel like a a curse word in the boutique industry. However, a lot of brands just have to learn how to kind of differentiate themselves to be able to accomplish both win-win for big box and boutique. And then I also do consulting. So I do consulting for wholesale brands, manufacturers from concept, sometimes to store shelves, or just depending on where they're at in the process. Because a lot of people don't realize what it actually takes to get on the shelf in the big box store while protecting their boutique brand. I like that. So I'm going to ask you this kind of in two parts related to Pink and Associates. What do you think the most successful brands that you work with have in common? And then what do you think the most successful reps that you work with in the industry have in common? Okay, let me answer the rep question first. The most successful reps... Nowadays, you've got to offer more than just coming in and and writing orders. I mean, now with the way everything that is shifting online, boutique owners are able to be more efficient. So I think right now, in my opinion, the best reps are teaching these store owners something that they don't know, helping them merchandise at a higher level, like coming in and having a deeper level of understanding on, you know, if you put these products here, here, and here, here's why these these type products are going to sell best at this part of your store and become more of a consultant. You know, they're not wanting to buy products. They could call anybody and buy those same products. The best sales reps are offering invaluable knowledge that they can't get anywhere else. And I think right now it's very true with big box, but I even think on the boutique level, they've got to offer more knowledge. Do you think that it's important for reps to have both an online and offline presence with the stores they work with? I do. I mean, I think whatever they do, it's got to be kept up with and it's got to be thorough and it's got to be consistent. Consistency breeds continuity. Continuity breeds trust. So those stores have got to be able to trust that it is going to be consistent if they're going to do it. I think sometimes reps get excited about new shiny objects and then they don't follow through and they were better off not starting in the first place. I think that's fair. How about brands that you work with? What are the most successful brands that you see have in common? You know, it would depend on the category. Right now, the most successful brands, they're breaking out, you know, they've lived in this playing field. This is where we live. This is what we do. This is how we do it. And they are realizing we've got to shift. We have to innovate, which means I'll use Hint as an example. And I've never done any work with them, but I was in a nugget market out here in California And I love Hint Water. It's like water that's healthy for you, but tastes like whatever, cucumbers or watermelon. And then I saw this Hint sunscreen spray that has like a hint of cucumber, watermelon or whatever. And I was like, geez, that's not even within their same (laughs) category (laughs) from water to sunscreen spray. But I think the most successful brands are finding ways to innovate and scale and build out different categories than what they currently lived in. Man, and building a lifestyle brand, not just a brand around one specific product at that, right? Yeah, and engagement with their customers, really honing in and getting very clear on who is my customer, what does she like, what does she need, and speaking and living in that. With the way everything is shifting in retail, a lot of companies are watering down their real message because they're trying to compete and they're being reactionary to what's happening to the market versus offensive, which is coming up with an original idea and living at the core of who and what your brand stands for. So I think they've got to circle back and really live with who are we? What are we? What are those core values? And how do we build out on that? Talk to me about, you know, just what you're saying, providing that unique experience, but as a whole, it's an experience, right? That's what consumers today are after. I know you and I were talking a little bit before the podcast about millennials and Gen Z and how that buyer is so drastically different than the buyer that the marketplace is used to and how brands can continue to evolve to meet the new breed of buyer. And by buyer, I mean like consumer, but that's also going to become a boutique consumer, a boutique buyer, right? As that evolves down the marketplace. Talk to me about how we create experiences for this new type of consumer. 
So Gen Z right now, they hold the largest buying power very soon with about $44 billion. And that buyer, they want experiences. I mean, that's why Sephora and Ulta and some of these bigger box places, they've got videos in their store where you can like do makeup on yourself in this mirror. You know, Gen Z, they love authenticity and buying brands that feel real. They're big on relationships. You know, they love loyalty programs. So I think, you know, if boutiques have any sort of, you know, loyalty program that they can build, they love that. They love building relationships and they love buying brands that give back and have a bigger purpose than just a great product. But creating in-store experiences from the actual product to them actually walking in and shopping, the second they walk into a boutique, if they feel something, Mm -hmm. they're going to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people say about my Texi Boots booth You're like, oh my gosh, the energy feels so great. Like, oh, it just feels amazing over here. Like they're feeling something because from the second you walk in, the branding and the atmosphere is so controlled in a positive way. I just love the saying that people don't remember the products they purchased from you, but they remember the way that you made them feel. And I think that's understated for so many people today. Like you were talking about the energy that you bring, right? I know that you're so conscious of how you show up for other people. And I think as store owners, if you're doing pop-ups or booths, whatever, your own brick and mortar store, your energy absolutely translates. If you're having a bad day, if you're feeling off about something, your customers immediately will feel that. So just go another level deep on how do you create that energy and that experience for you And what areas of your brand have you really honed in on to make sure that experience lives in your booth? I will speak more in a technical way, like for a boutique owner, a pop-up, it's an opportunity. It's not a guarantee. What you do prior to that event, what you do at that actual pop-up, and then what you do post pop-up or post trade show, creating an experience is, it's a process. So for example, some of my trade shows, I will send out specific invites, like a little postcard type invite for people to come and experience my booth. And it talks a little bit about the brand, what the brand does, but it's building that brand impression and it's beautiful and it's organized. And then I make sure that if I have their emails, then obviously, you know, I'll send a follow up email probably two weeks prior, the day before. I cannot wait to meet you, cannot wait to see you, whatever. Then creating that atmosphere at the actual show for me. I mean, I have a certain candle, vanilla scent makes people want to spend more money. It's weird, but <laughs> it. <laughs> Write that it, down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this was me just like, how do I have really good sales at my trade show, like just Googling, I swear, random (laughs) things to find that little tidbit. So I always have to create that atmosphere. You know, if the certain music that you have playing, the attention to detail, I wouldn't just plop on the radio. I would actually build out a playlist of positive, uplifting songs that I know are going to create the kind of atmosphere that I want. And then post-show, I'm handwriting thank you cards. I mean, I even did this when I was working at Poopery. Anybody that placed a certain amount of a dollar amount order, they would get a handwritten card for me after every show. And sometimes I'd have to come in at five in the morning and just work from five to seven for a week or two just to write out all those cards. But it's the attention to detail and it's the things that people are not willing to typically do that keep people consistently coming back because of how you make them Mm. feel. So good. All right. So I want to shift gears a little bit because besides Google, who have you looked at as like mentors or places that you go often to fill your cup? Like you were talking about books and podcasts and how you're always like breathing new life into yourself that way. Who do you consider to be your mentors and where do you go for inspiration? I would say the female that's had the most impact on my life was Susie Batiz the founder of Poopery. Even still to this day, you know, we live in different states, but she is constantly on Instagram, doing Instagram lives and pouring out life. I think because so much wisdom and knowledge is accessible everywhere that people discount the actual value of it. Meaning I know sometimes like I'm busy doing whatever and I see that her little Instagram bubble is lighting up and she probably made a new inspirational post. Well, to get an hour of that woman's time, 
I don't even want to know how much that would cost. But a lot of times people, instead of clicking on that to learn, just keep scrolling. Do you think it's also true that either people devalue it by scrolling past or adversely, some people consume so much of it and they're constantly like filling themselves up, but then they don't take the action. Like the 800 emails you sent, they don't want to do that part. They want to be inspired, but they don't want to do the one hour of work that it takes to like do the thing, right? Yes. I think our responsibility is it should come to us and through us. And I just think that real confidence is built through and only through, in my opinion, taking action. So no one can rattle my cage. I mean, someone could try to knock me off tomorrow. Well, they don't realize I'm willing to sleep two to three hours a night. I may not be the smartest, but I will figure out how to outwork, outmaneuver, out whatever to get what I want. And that confidence doesn't come from listening to a million podcasts and reading a million books and hiding it in my house, waiting for my dream to come knocking on the door. It comes from me knocking down that door and say, I don't know where you are, dream, but I'm going to find you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yes. Everyone needs to take note of that to a T because, man, you, you can't replace that. I love that you said confidence is built through taking action. Man, write that down and repeat it. So on that note, though, Talk to me about this word balance, because you and I both kind of giggled about this like elusive word. Do you think people hide behind that word when they're fearful of taking an action? Yes. So the word balance to me, I've actually been going through a really interesting transition here lately of, you know, I I walked away from a client that was requiring about probably 80 to 100 hours of my week outside of taxi boots. And so I found myself coming into a place where I had a lot more time. So I'm feeling more balanced, but I used to find it to be like a curse word. I was like, here I am sacrificing everything. I'm working a full-time corporate job a hundred hours a week. And I was on 150 plus flights last year to basically self-fund my taxi boot business by working a corporate job. Like I'm willing to do whatever it takes, like get out of my way. If you're going to talk negative, shut up. And people are like, you need to find balance. They're like, shut up. <laughs> like, You have find a bigger dream. Like clearly you don't know what it takes to be successful. Now I found that I lived on quite the extreme and I was my entire life quite unbalanced. Sleeping two to three hours a night for years on end is not healthy. And people know when they're unbalanced, they find themselves unhappy. They find themselves drained. But I do think people do hide behind it and they just prefer to be lazy. There's a way to be productive and effective and still find balance, but that requires taking action. Right. It's a choice, right? To take the action. What's as easy to do is just as easy not to do. So you might as well just buckle up, pull up your boots and do it. All right. Let's talk about some lightning round questions. You down? I'm down. All right. Favorite podcast? Um, How I Built This with Guy Raz. Oh, that's, that's so many good episodes on that. Yeah. And yours too, Ashley. I wish I had known about yours like years ago. So yours is becoming a favorite. I'm not just saying that, but especially this episode, this one's definitely going to be one of my favorites. Just well, kidding. of course it is. <laughs> yes. And I will slip you 20 bucks later. You got it. <laughs> All right. Your favorite book? I would say The Sales Challenger by Matt Dixon. Oh, I've not heard of this one, but I'm gonna have to look it up. We'll link it in the show notes. Favorite Instagram influencer? That would be Gary Vaynerchuk. All right. What scares you the most? Snakes, payroll, or internet trolls? Um, Snakes. (laughs) Perfect. Favorite trend at the moment? Favorite trend? Faux fur good trend that you miss like something you wish would come back and be a trend again is like 70s love songs a trend <laughs> <laughs> i guess it could be send me an example of what you're talking about <laughs> um, like james taylor you've got a friend <laughs> <laughs> you hopeless romantic so sweet <laughs> All right. Trend you wish would die. Like those high-waisted shorts that look like they could double as a support bra. They're so high. Like I, those are weird. All right. Last one. Your favorite apps or organizational tools? Favorite 
apps, probably my running app, like Strava, which is just to track like fitness, biking and that sort of thing. My favorite organizational tool, and this is going to make me sound like not super techie because I'm not my Google Drive. (laughs) No, that totally counts. I'm always amazed at how many people don't know what Google Drive is. And it is life, y'all. It's life. All right. So last question before we wrap up together, what is for everybody who's listening today, if you could give them like one action that you wish they would take after hearing your story, what is the one thing you wish they'd run and do? Figure out what it is that you want very clearly and by when, and then be real about what you're willing to give up in order to get it and then go get it. All right. Well, girl, I know you listen to the show, so you probably know how we end each show. But when you talk about female entrepreneurs and giving back and like this greater mission that you serve, I know that you're in this for much more than just a product, right? It's it's about more than just the pink soul. So talk to me about your legacy in 20, 30, 40 years when you know you sell the company or you pass it down to family or whatever it is you choose to do in the future. And you're looking back on the businesses that you created and the businesses you served what is the thing that you wish people would remember most about you and your legacy? I wish that people, like if they could say one thing, it would say, she helped inspire me, pulled me out of my rut to go after and chase my dreams. And I mean, they have to be willing to do the work to make them become a reality. But it's my vision to have Texi Boots have helped. I mean, every year, a female founder, so you're talking 20 years from now, 20 female entrepreneurs being able to help them launch their own businesses 50 years from now. And I just want that ripple effect from one female entrepreneur helping another that maybe just maybe she may be inspired to do the same. Oh man, Michelle, your, your light is so contagious. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today and sharing your story with us. Girl, this was so fun. Thanks for having me. You bet. So anyone who's listening, you can obviously find more information in the show notes on Pink and Associates and on Taxi Boots and follow up with Michelle personally. But we thought we'd also throw something kind of fun into the show today. So we are going to have a giveaway. Do you want to tell us what the giveaway is for? Yes. So we are going to be giving away a pair of my original Pink Soul Cowgirl Boots. Ooh, and I have to get a pair. So I'm going to, I need to like enter the giveaway, right? <laughs> so in order to enter the giveaway, um, on the day that the podcast goes live, obviously on Tuesday, make sure that you follow us over on Instagram. You can follow Texi Boots at Texi, T E X I Boots, and follow AJ Alderson. We're both going to be posting about the show. Make sure you're following both of our accounts and drop a comment on both of those posts about what you loved about this episode the most. And then, Michelle, you're going to be choosing a winner and announcing it on your gram. That sounds awesome. I'm so excited to do that. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys, thank you so much for listening to the show. And, Michelle, thank you so much again for joining me today. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We hope that you loved it. Don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a rating and review down below for a chance to be one of our featured listeners each and every week. For more information on our spirit of community over competition and how to access complete show notes and bonus downloads from our guests, head on over to theboutiquehub.com and join the community. We'll see you next week.